Hello and welcome to The Naked Scientists. This week we come to you with a special programme looking back at all the great science we've uncovered over the last year. And what a year it's been, especially for space science, with the Philae lander finally waking up on a comet and the New Horizons probe reaching Pluto nine years after its launch. Of course, it's also been pretty exciting back on Earth too, with the discovery of a whole new species of hominid in September. And it's not all been about science news, from parasites to plastics. We've also been digging beneath the surface of science. I'm Greer Jackson. And I'm Connie Orbach, and this is The Naked Scientists. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. You've probably heard bits and bobs from both Connie and myself before. We're two of the producers of the programme, so we work behind the scenes, collecting stories, writing scripts. But this week, instead of Chris and Kat, we've hijacked the mics to play you some of our favourite moments. Georgia wanted to be here too, but alas, she's in the midst of her next show. It's about black holes. Stay tuned for that. But now, the beginning of the programme, and in fact, the beginning of everything... But is there actually a beginning of time? I decided to try and answer one of the really big questions of not only science, but also philosophy. Many cosmologists now think that there is. This view goes back to a discovery that the universe is expanding, a discovery made in the 1920s. Logical implication of that is that there must have been a time when it was at minimum size, and that's what we now think of as the Big Bang. And on most views, that's the beginning of time. There's literally nothing before that. Basically, with the Big Bang, time was created. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang because, well, the Big Bang created time. Armed with the best physics in the 20th century, Albert Einstein came to a very similar conclusion with his theory of relativity, which states that time isn't quite the same everywhere. Planet Earth's hefty mass warps time. It's why the clocks on orbiting satellites run slightly slower and why astronauts on the International Space Station return having aged slightly less. Although not by much, it must be said. That's an aside, but the big picture here is that space and time is warped by mass. And because all the mass in the universe would have been contained in something smaller than an atom, it would have brought time to a standstill. Ergo, the beginning of time is the Big Bang. Or is it? Well, there are cosmologists who think that the Big Bang wasn't really the beginning. What happened was that instead of collapsing like that, the matter bounced. And so people talk about the Big Bounce rather than the Big Bang. It's a a, a cycle of bounces and collapses. So then that means... Time is infinite, and there is no beginning of time if it's continually contracting and expanding, no? Yeah, exactly. The message I'm taking away is either you believe in the Big Bang and that before the singularity there was no such thing as time, that that massive expansion, that is when time was created, or you believe in the Big Bounce and that means time is infinite and there is no beginning of time. Yeah, I think those are the the two basic options. But, of course, one of the nice things about science in general and physics in particular is that it has a a delightful way of coming up with new options so we can't be absolutely sure that something else won't come along. Time is infinite then or it begins with the Big Bang. Simple. But where do cosmologists sit? Is there any evidence to support either theory? Roberto Trotto from Imperial College London gave me the lowdown. Up first was the Big Bounce. This picture is actually in doubt today because we now know that our universe is not going to recollapse. It is actually going to expand forever. Sorry, how do we know that our universe isn't going to recollapse? And, and that's, that's, a, that's because of dark energy. 70% of our universe is made of a, an unknown type of force or energy that we call dark energy, uh, whose main impact on the universe is to make the expansion of the universe accelerate with time. So not only the universe is growing with time today, it's growing at an ever-accelerating speed. And it will not be a big crunch that will end our universe. The end will be a state of darkness where all the matter will have been sucked into black holes. A slightly scary space. Sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. Yes, but it's, it's about 200 billion years in the future, so there is nothing to worry about. <laughs> so that theory is in doubt. What other theories might there be that have more support? 
Some ideas are rather different. They postulate the existence of parallel universes, effectively. So our universe is made of uh, three space dimensions and one time dimension, so it's a four-dimensional universe. But what if there were additional dimensions that we cannot actually penetrate ourselves? Five-dimensional spaces and universes being sucked into black holes. This all sounds a little mind-boggling to me. But fortunately, Roberto had some lasagna to hand to show me how parallel universes could work. Okay. Let's give our parallel universes four minutes. So whilst it's just quickly heating up, this is to demonstrate the various parallel universes. You've got layers of vegetable, because this is a vegetarian lasagna, I noticed. And then you've got the layers of pasta and cheese. So what signifies what here? The layers of pasta are going to symbolise and represent different parallel universes, separated by something, which in this case is the vegetable filling. You'll have other layers, which are just universes, just like us, but they are separated from us across a fifth dimension, and that, that's the dimension where the stuffing resides. Mm, oops. So now we are going to cut the lasagna in the middle to reveal nicely our parallel universes. Let's see, ah yes, we can see there are about four or five parallel universes in it. And now the idea is that if we have gravity leaking through the two lasagna layers, the two pasta layers will be smashed together. They will be attracted one to the other. And when they hit like this, they're gonna splash all the sauce out and this is gonna be the Big Bang effectively. If this theory is correct, it means not only are there an infinite number of universes, but also time too is infinite. But that's a big if. Will we ever know for sure? It's, it's very difficult to say. Um, I think it's actually quite impressive to be able to say that we can now reconstruct with a high degree of fidelity the history of the universe from today, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, to the very beginning, some 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. All that remains to be tested is this tiny sliver of time, 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. And so in a sense, the job of scientists at the forefront of research is always that of pushing back the limit of the unknown. And so now we are really hitting the very hard, very deep, very fundamental questions. I think I like the idea of time as infinite. So many possibilities. That was cosmologist Roberto Trotter and before him, philosopher Hugh Price. Now, here at The Naked Scientist, we're clearly happy to move from the biggest of questions to some of the smallest. Like, can we walk on eggs? We had lots of fun at Easter with our excellent Easter special and I think everyone's favourite moment was when Georgia persuaded Chris to quite literally stand on eggshells. Well, people say about walking on eggshells, I am quite literally about to do this. Georgia, I'm very nervous, actually. You've made me take my shoe off. I have indeed. We're going to test the strength of eggs today and see if they together can support your weight. So I've got a standard six eggs carton on the floor With six eggs in it, I haven't done anything to them. I've checked that there aren't any cracks in them. And that's all. And you're going to stand on them now. This is this sort of cardboard carton that you get from the supermarket. And there are six rather nice looking eggs in there. And you want me to just stand with one foot, just stand on that. Yes, it'll be a shame if this goes wrong. But I have faith in the structural integrity of these eggs. Right, so I have taken my shoe off. I'm putting my socked foot on top of the eggs in the egg box. Um, And now I want you to make sure your weight is evenly distributed across all of the six eggs. Okay, I'm going to put my arm on you just so I can um, just stay stable. Right, and uh, here we go. I'm going to now stand on the eggs. Okay, you wouldn't believe it, and I am very nervous doing this, but I am standing on one leg, on one foot, on a box full of eggs. I am genuinely doing that, and they haven't broken. I'm just as surprised as you, I think. (laughs) And I am very relieved. I'm amazed, actually. I thought, honestly, I thought that my feet were going to go straight through them, and I was going to have a very eggy sock. That's the amazing property of an egg. If we did this on their side... 
this wouldn't work at all. Do you want to try that, Chris? I'm not doing that, but let's just grab an egg. So th- these really are genuine eggs. They're not hard boiled or anything. I can I can shake it. I can feel the the sort of yolk and stuff sloshing around inside. So what's special about this that I can stand on it in that way? Eggs have a really good shape for this kind of compression. If you look at them, they're, they're ovals. They're like an arch shape. And we use this kind of shape in architecture all the time. You think about bridges, you think about domed ceilings. If you push on the top of an egg, because it's such a narrow arch, the force is distributed all throughout the body of the egg, meaning it won't break. However, if you put a smaller force on the long edge of the egg, this actually squeezes in the inside of the egg as well. And the eggs are really bad withstanding this kind of pressure. What you're saying is this egg is, because of its shape, when I apply a force to the, the curved top of the egg, basically I'm compressing all of the material in the egg in all directions and it's sort of transferring the force down all of the sides evenly. Whereas if I turn the egg on its side and I were to stand on that, and I'm not going to do it, much to your disappointment, I won't be doing that, but if I were to stand on the side of the egg, then I would be bending the shell a bit and there wouldn't be that transfer of load all over the egg. It would just basically bend the shell and, and it's not very strong when you make it stretch and it's going to bust open. Exactly, which is why when you crack an egg, you do it on the side, you'd never do it on the top. Did eggs evolve to have this shape for that reason? Is that why the egg has got this property, to to stop the chicken literally cracking its own eggs? That's right. So when a mother hen sits on her eggs, the last thing she wants to do is to squish all her babies. So with these eggs pointing upright, it distributes her weight all around. But then when these tiny, weak chickens need to get out, a small force on the side of the egg enables them to crack out of the egg. Well, look, from uh, from me here with a very un-eggy sock, I'm very lucky to have escaped. And I'm very impressed, actually. I will be demonstrating that probably to the delight of my kids again, Georgia. Thank you very much. Georgia Mills. I don't think I ever saw Chris quite so nervous as he was then. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Connie Orbeck, and Greer Jackson. Now, as a Naked Scientist newbie, I've got to say I love working here. And it's not just because of the lovely team, though, of course, Greer, that does help. I should hope so. But my favourite part is definitely getting to go out and do exciting things for the show. And the best thing yet definitely has to be trying on the Mimu gloves. Software designer Adam Stark let me have a go and I felt like an absolute superhero. Hi, is that Adam? Yeah, yeah, come on, shut My name's Adam Stark and I am a software developer and I've been working on the Mimu gloves now for about four years, trying to turn all the rich data we get about your hand into music. At the moment, if you want to make electronic music, you're normally presented with uh, a MIDI keyboard or some buttons or knobs or faders, but they're not very expressive ways of performing electronic music. The, the thing that's really, really expressive about people more than almost anything is their hands. And so we wanted to make a device that captures the expressiveness of your hands and uses that as a controller for making electronic music. I feel like the best way to explain this is if you you let me have a go, is that possible? Sure, I'll talk you through it. Okay, fantastic. What do we need to do first? So the first thing, we need to put the gloves on and then we need to calibrate them for your hands because everyone's hands are different. The gloves are black, thin and feel very fragile. But actually, they're incredibly sturdy and designed specifically to be strong, flexible and unobtrusive. They're wireless and even fingerless, so you can play other instruments whilst you wear them. But most importantly, they're covered in electronics. There are either one or two bend sensors, depending on the finger. So this detects the, the bend of your knuckles. OK. So if you, if you just feel the end of your fingers, you'll feel something hard there. There's like a kind of ribbon running down to yeah. my fingers, and that's a flex bend sensor? Yeah, that's a bend sensor. This part here, this, uh, this little board... Um, on the wrist detects the orientation of your hands so it would detect sort of the roll of your wrist and then if you move your wrist up and down or from left to right and that's all of the sensors on the glove um so for, in terms of the information like going into the glove those are the two things so the bend of your fingers and the orientation of your wrist but we have a couple of pieces of feedback as well so we have an led here which will light up we, we can program that to to tell you different things about the software so you can really don't have to look at the screen. After a bit more fiddling to get the gloves in place, it was time to configure the software to my hand. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to press calibrate and you're just going to move your your hand open and close and make sure you're moving all of your fingers, including your thumb, from fully bent to Okay, so clench them like a fist and then then open them back out. Once the software knew the extent of the movement in my hand, we could program it to gestures. So Adam got me to make a few different movements, like a fist or a pointed finger and the software remembered them 
so it could later match them to particular musical commands. So what I've set up here is um, a way for you to play chords using the gloves. If you make a fist with your right hand, that will play a, a certain chord, and if you let go, it will stop. Okay. Now, if you move to a different direction, make a fist, it will play a different chord. And so there's one out there, it should be as well. <gasps> oh, this is so exciting. So I'm moving my hand in front of me, um, above my head, uh, to the side. And Put down. down. Yeah. There should be one over this side as well. That's to the uh, left. To my left as opposed to So now right. if you, you make this one again in front of you. Mm -hmm. Now move the, on your left hand. Um, so what, the right hand here is now making a fist. So on the left hand, if you roll your wrist while you make the, the, the sound, you can control the, the tone of it there. Wow, I have so much power in my hands right now. Oh! Yeah. I had so much fun playing with the gloves. I can't imagine what someone with actual musical abilities might be able to do. Of course, I was far too distracted to manage an actual interview. So, sadly, the time came when I had to take the gloves off and get back to work. We allow you to combine together um, different movements. So you might say, if I'm making a fist and I'm rolling my wrist from, from left to right, that particular movement, we connect it to some piece of music software. Uh, maybe it's the volume fader or maybe it's the panning around the room or it's the amount of reverb. And so they were originally a tool for Imogen, but you have many other people using these gloves as well, is that right? That's right. Um, we realised that there was something really, really powerful in these gloves and that, that every time we gave them to somebody different to put them on, they used them in a completely different way. And so we've now got about 20 different uh, users around the world and they're using it for all kinds of different things. So we've got uh, film composers, there's Ariana Grande, who's a sort of pop star, and we've got a charity called Drake Music, who work with musicians with disabilities who are kind of barriers to them making uh, music. So they use technology to try and break down those barriers. And uh, we're working with a musician called Chris Halpin, and he's been uh, making huge use of the gloves and gigging all over the place. He has a cerebral palsy, and he's had a, a journey through dealing with his condition and trying to find ways around his condition to make music. And, and I think the gloves for him have been uh, somewhat of an emancipation. And there's a, there's a lot of performance involved in wearing these gloves. You really have to be willing to throw your hands around and, and play with it. So I guess it's, there's only a certain type of performer that would be happy doing this as well. I think that's a, that's a really good question. I'm a, I'm a guitarist and I play in a, in a band where normally you kind of tend to look at your guitar pedals and that kind of thing. And suddenly you're looking up at the audience and you're moving your hands around and it's, it's a very different experience. And um, sometimes I really love it and sometimes I feel a bit like a lemon. <laughs> but, um, that, but yeah, it does take a certain personality, but it does communicate to people better, I think, than almost anything else. I'm not sure that I'd feel comfortable flailing my arms around on stage, but maybe that's why I'm not a performer that and the whole musical ability thing. But with these gloves, there seems little doubt that technology and creativity are hand in hand. I'm super jealous of those Mew Mew gloves. And actually, there's a video online, you can watch it, of Connie trying out the gloves. And it's adorable. It will be on our Facebook page, but we'll also put it on our website. That was Adam Stark with the Mew Mew gloves. Now, I was also incredibly jealous of the beautiful Georgia when she got her hands on a real-life drone. These are these unmanned aerial vehicles flown with a remote control. More and more people are getting involved, and a whole culture is built up around the new sport of drone racing. So Georgia went along to try her hand at it with drone racer Simon Vans Kalina from London Hackspace. Drones themselves, as a thing that you can buy, a consumer product, are only a few years old. But as mobile phone technology sort of made chips available that are fast and good accelerometers, uh, that's um, made possible smaller and smaller drones. And at some point about two years ago, people realised that you could build these small carbon fibre drones with good quality lithium polymer batteries, and they were really, really fast. And then people just started racing them. And how did you get into racing? I saw a video on YouTube when I was snowboarding once and uh, it was somebody just like absolutely flying through the trees and it reminded me of sort of Star Wars, the, the pod racing or like flying uh, speeders through the forest and I was like, I just have to do that. So I think I ordered all of the bits on that, that first weekend and, and then built my first one. And how do you go about building a drone? You watch a lot of YouTube videos. 
Everybody who flies drones at the moment also builds them. There aren't really any off-the-shelf ready-to-buy racing drones yet, although they're coming. Even if you buy one off the shelf, the first time you crash it, you're going to have to rebuild it. And crashing and rebuilding is part of the, the hobby or part of the sport so far. And is there any element of, of software to it? The drones all have a little uh, computer chip called a, a flight controller. Uh, and that runs a, an algorithm called the PID loop. So yeah, you can, you can download the source code for this. They're all open source. If you know programming, if you know a little bit of C, you can download the source code and just hack on it and make it do what you want. And I see you've got some here laid out on this table. There are, there are a variety of sizes. All of them have four sticky-outy propellers on them. Can you tell me a bit about these guys? This is the Thug 180. It's made by um, Thug Frames. Um, this one here I call the Nerd because it's kind of I designed it myself and it looks like it's got glasses on. <laughs> and the camera in the front of it is the Nerd Cam. The Nerd is the one that can see in 3D. I'm quite excited to see one of these in the air. Can we, can we have sure. a go? Yep, let's do it. So you, right. you'll put these goggles on here. What are these goggles for? These are uh, these received a picture from the from the drone, so you see what the drone sees. Oh wow! So we get a drone's eye view of of the flight. Yep, exactly. And I see you've got a spare, so you're going to take me along for a ride. Yep, absolutely. So you'll see you'll see uh, the same thing that I'm seeing. Oh, <laughs> that's so weird. So I can see myself through the nerd vision, <laughs> as it so were, um, with the goggles. So what right. it is, I'm going to fly for you now, and you can just uh, sit back and enjoy the. The 3D vision. <laughs> so we're just hovering in the air now, taking a look at... <laughs> it's looking at Simon as he's got the controller and going really low. You can see almost the, each blade of grass coming towards you. This is <laughs> quite frightening. I wouldn't recommend doing this on an empty stomach, to be honest. <laughs> So seeing yourself through a drone as it's flying towards you has got to be one of the strangest experiences. Can I trust that you're not going to fly this thing into me? <laughs> oh, it's coming very close. Almost felt the breeze there as it flew past. Really picking up speed now, zooming along along the ground. And oh, oh no, I had a 3D crash. Let's go and see if it's okay. Is it all right? <laughs> it's Look robust. The and roll. <laughs> Tell you, Avatar's got nothing on this. That's great, isn't it? A live 3D drone crash. It's amazing. Yeah. When is drone racing going to be in the Olympics? Ah, oh, soon. I hope. I, it's so much fun. <laughs> There's so many leagues starting up. There's a big one in the US called the Drone Nationals, which is bringing together the best pilots in the world and. And it's an amazing spectator sport too because everybody brings their goggles and everybody watches everybody else's race from the first person. So it's like, you you know, imagine going to the Formula 1 races but everybody can see the view from the driver's cockpit the whole time. So it's, it's yeah, it's really fun. Is it all fun and games with these drones? Is there any other applications people have been looking into? We know people that are putting infrared cameras on drones to do search and rescue. So if there was somebody, you know, a hiker lost in the forest, Amazon's talking about using drones to do deliveries. I personally can't see how that's going to work i don't think it's going to work in london it's very hard to find somewhere you can safely drop a package off in london is there any chance that people could hack into drones sure absolutely i mean i saw a tweet the other day that one day we'll see a a news drone chasing a police drone that's chasing a pirate drone that ripped off an amazon drone like we use frequency hopping and encrypted radio already so that we don't have to worry about people taking over our drones but our video signals are still analog like when we're flying anybody can pick up our video signals I was in very competent hands when we flew around, but say, I don't know, someone had had a bit to drink when they are flying, and there's yeah, Don't nothing. drink a drone. <laughs> it's one of the rules. So can you program a drone? Yeah, so there's a, there's a piece of software called NodeCopter, which is, lets you um, send commands to the drone using the same programming language that they use on the web. So if you know JavaScript, you can basically program a node copter to take off, hover, turn right, turn left. Uh, it doesn't give it the sort of machine vision, um, obstacle avoidance or waypointing or anything like that. But for just like really basic uh, controls, you can, you can have a computer control a drone really easily. I saw a video on YouTube of someone, I think they'd coded it to follow red. And someone was running around with a red red flag and the drone was chasing them. Is, is, that, is that possible? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, the image recognition stuff, you have to send the video back to a computer at the moment. Like, as computers get faster, we're hoping to move more and more of those smart algorithms onto the, onto the microprocessor, on the, uh, on the drone, um, which might, will make them a lot more autonomous. Whereas at the moment, a lot of those demos are done by sending the video back to a computer that then 
does this like the, the localization and mapping and, and image processing and then sends the commands back to the drone which works fine as long as the drone's very very close to the computer and there's no lag but it's not going to work um you know for an autonomous drone that's at range simon van Scalina there wishing he'd never given his drone to georgia mills Synthetic biology is is a very interesting phenomenon. It's very much grassroots based. There's this large community of very enthusiastic participants. In this month's Naked Genetics podcast, we return to the world of synthetic biology, discovering some of the ways this revolutionary technology might change the world. Plus, a genetic test to reveal flu risk and a twisted gene of the month. Listen and download now at nakedscientist.com slash genetics. This is The Naked Scientist with me, Greg Jackson, and Connie Orbach. What have you got in store for us next, Connie? It's already been such a blast down memory lane. Well, you know we pride ourselves on bringing you the latest in science news, direct from the horse's mouth. And in September, we covered a story which gave a whole new angle on the origins of humanity. The discovery of Homo naledi in South Africa introduced a new species of human ancestor to the world with a clue to their culture. Chris Smith spoke to the people who made the discovery. Lee Berger from the University of Witwatersand, Charles Musiba from the University of Colorado, and up first, Wisconsin University's John Hawkes. If you looked at Homo naledi from some distance, they would stand about you know, 1.4 meters high, the size of a small human. They stand upright. They're very thin looking in build. And as you look closer, you notice that there's some things wrong about them. Their heads are very small. Their heads are around a third the size of ours in, in terms of their brain size. Their hips are cast much more like a more primitive hominin, something like Lucy, the famous skeleton. Their shoulders are sort of canted upwards in a way that we associate with some of the most primitive hominins. We think that that's probably related to climbing. But it's very clear that when you look at the details, the things that that strike us as being so human-like, the feet, they're clearly adapted for walking long distances in the way that that humans have. Their hands, very human-like through the wrist and the palm. Their thumb is, is appropriate for humans in its length. But the fingers are very curved, and that thumb is is immensely powerful, something that we've never seen before in the fossil record. Their teeth also really quite human-like in their size, in in what they look like they would have been suited for in in terms of eating, but they have features in them that we've never seen before in in humans or any other kind of hominin. And Lee, how did you find them in the first place? Well, they were found uh, as part of an organized uh, search. I'd actually enlisted a former student of mine, employed him to actually be going underground in the caves just outside of Johannesburg. He, in turn, enlisted two amateur cavers, uh, Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker. And what that led to in mid-September of 2013 was Steve and Rick entering a very tiny, narrow passage about 20 meters underground that's about 17 and a half centimeters wide, dropping down 12 meters into a chamber where they chanced upon this remarkable discovery. I saw the first photos on October 1st. That led to uh, a 60-person expedition that we launched on November 7th, which led to the recovery of this remarkable sample of uh, fossil hominids. Well, when you saw that photograph, just describe the scene for us in that situation. What did you see? I was at home. At night, uh, 9 o'clock in the evening, working on some emails, and uh, the, the doorbell rang, and there was Pedro on the other side, and he said, you're going to let want to let me in, and I almost didn't give him that tone. And he came in with Steve in tow, and they opened up this laptop, and there sitting in the middle of this picture was a, a mandible, that's a jawbone, with these beautiful teeth that I could immediately tell were from a very primitive or ancient hominid. I could tell by the shape of them. The next slide was that of a skull or at least half a skull, embedded in the dirt of the, uh, of the ground. And just to say, we don't see fossils like that in southern Africa. Most of our fossils are embedded in concrete-like rock. These were sitting in dirt loose. The next slide was of more bones, and I thought I was looking at a skeleton. I, I was stunned. I'd never seen anything like that. And Charles Masiba, who's also part of the team from the University of Colorado, when you look at those teeth, where do they fit in? Well, when you look at those teeth... Uh, you realize that they are not modern humans. They have some features transitional between modern humans and some of our earliest ancestors. It's very interesting in that uh, it may be signaling some completely different type of adaptation to maybe a different type of dietary behavior, which may not necessarily be exactly like ours. And John, given 
where these specimens were found, how do you account for them being there? You know, this is the thing that occupied us as we were excavating. This is the largest assemblage of bone that we found for early hominins anywhere. And we found them together with no animal bones other than a, a few little fragments. So there's something very curious about the way that these hominins entered this chamber. There's no evidence that these bones were ever altered or chewed on by carnivores. It's clearly not some sort of predator that's dragged them into this cave. There's no signs of it at all. We've looked at the sediments within the chamber where we find them, and we can show that those sediments originated within the chamber. They don't have grains that have come from the external environment. And in fact, the nearby chambers don't have grains that have come from the external environment. We look at that and we think it's very likely that the entrance to the chamber in the past was always pitch black and isolated from the outside environment. That explains why other creatures besides the hominins were not able to reach the chamber. And it creates a problem in that Homo naledi has to have been able to access the entrance of this and reach it inside with bodies. So you're saying that these pretty primitive, small-brained individuals must have been intentionally depositing either themselves or they're dead or dying in this chamber, and then they remained in situ for you to find potentially up to two and a half million years later. What we were working in here is a bed that's full of hominin bone, and that includes articulated elements like complete hands and feet, things that would have been disarticulated rapidly if the bodies had not entered this chamber whole. We've got them in a situation where they could not have been washed in, where there's no evidence that there's a catastrophe that's happened to them, where they're clearly entered the chamber over some period of time. We don't know how long, but not instantaneously. We can, in other words, exclude the things that seem simple, like some sort of catastrophic event, some sort of flood, some sort of predator that's a death trap that, that's, that's had them fall in. We're left with the explanation that Homo naledi itself must have been intentionally depositing bodies at the entrance of this chamber or into the chamber itself. That was John Hawkes, and before him, Lee Badger and Charles Masiba. Talking of ancient people, in the summer we did a show all about one of our most basic emotions, disgust. At the time, Ginny claimed she was really interested in why we need to feel disgust, but I've got a feeling she just really wanted to do this experiment with Kat. Now, Kat, I've got a little experiment to try out on you to see how easily you're disgusted. OK. And our intern James and our guest Alison, who are also here in the studio, are going to join us for this. Does anyone like chocolate spread? Kind of, yeah. Ooh. Mm. I've got a, a well-known a nice, brand of hazelnut and chocolate spread. Very delicious. So who would like some chocolate spread? I've got some spoons here. Anyone like to try some? Yeah. Happy. Sounds good. OK. Now, I'm not going to hand you the pot because, I mean, you can't eat straight out of the pot. That's just, that's not um. allowed. So <laughs> all you have to do in order to eat some of this delicious chocolate spread is eat it out of the thing that I am currently passing to you. So do you want to just tell everyone oh, what you've no. got there? Okay, so what I've just been handed is a disposable nappy <laughs> that's full of Nutella. Now, I'm I'm not a mum. Thanks for the spoon, Jenny. I'm not a mum, but I am a very proud auntie. And I have seen nappies with this kind of content. And this is just... <laughs> I mean, this is revolting. It's chocolate spread. You know it's chocolate spread. Um, you can probably even smell that it's chocolate spread. But it kind of, like, it smells kind of poopy. Is anyone willing to try it? What about you two? Yeah. yeah. Oh. This is a completely clean it's, nappy. I promise it was a clean nappy. I bought them today. But it looks pretty disgusting, isn't it? Oh, Alison, you're trying it. How does it taste? It tastes like chocolate spread. But did you feel anything when you were sort of digging in with the spoon? Or I did, can't do it. it okay? I think it was fine. Like it, a nappy is something that would have to be quite clean to be go onto a baby. So I kind of trust the manufacturer to keep it clean and trust you to have not played any nasty tricks on us. <laughs> and James, how about you? It tastes fine, but it, it definitely still feels slightly strange. I'm slightly not regretting it, but but definitely wouldn't wouldn't do it normally. Um, I actually feel physically sick. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's really interesting. We have one who found it absolutely fine, one mm. who sort of managed it, but it felt a bit weird, and Kat, who just flat out refused to even try it. I can't. So, you know, I can clean up people's puke. That's absolutely fine. Poo. Mm, I, I can't deal with it. Ugh. 
I think I would have been with Kat on that one. There is just something about it that is utterly disgusting. I'm not sure I could eat Nutella from a nappy either. So let's go far, far away from that thought. In fact, let's go so far, we're almost on the edge of our solar system. In August, I did a whole hour on everyone's favourite planet slash not a planet Pluto. And as part of that show, I wanted to look into the cloud of dust that Pluto is part of the Kuiper Belt. Scott Thomas was kind enough to show me around the skies at the Institute of Astronomy. Excellent. Safe. Light. Oh, wow. The real claim to fame for this telescope was that it nearly discovered the planet Neptune. Nearly. Yes, nearly. So the story goes that um, John Cooch Adams, who was a famous astronomer who uh, worked here at the observatory, he was an undergraduate at Cambridge, and at the time the planet Uranus had been known um, and there were irregularities in its orbit, so it wasn't moving in the way that people thought it should. And the obvious explanation for this was that there was something out past its orbit that was speeding it up and slowing it down. And John Cooch Adams got wind of this idea. He spent his entire summer holidays just trying to calculate the position of this planet. And they lost. Yes. Unfortunately, the French, they took their calculations, they opened up the telescope, and I think within an hour they'd found it. They were both lucky and they had slightly better maps, I think. So to me, it kind of looks like scaffolding. (laughs) Where is some elaborate scaffolding on a slant? Where is the actual telescope? The actual telescope is the bit right in the middle there. And you can see the eyepiece down the bottom. And then at the top, we have a very sophisticated lens cap, which um, at the moment also includes a plastic bag to keep it dry. (laughs) So you say the lens cap is on the bottom. Does that mean you lie on the floor to look up through it? Yes, you do. So um, there's a big observer's chair here, which is a, a sort of wooden structure that extends out to the side of the room, and it rolls round... Do you get a duvet as well on a pillow? I've often wondered about this because I can imagine in the middle of winter it must be freezing and the middle of winter is the best time to observe so I imagine you'd wear some pretty heavy duty clothing. I think you should go and sit down. I'll open up the slit. Oh wow! So the whole roof is moving and with it the slit is moving round to, well, to meet my every need. You adjust the focus just sort of by pulling this bit in and out. It really is. It is very difficult to stress just how much easier it is doing this on a modern telescope. I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> but, um, we need a star chart. We do need a star chart. Anyway, that's, um, that's sitting nicely in frame there. Oh, I can't see anything. Oh, the cat's coming. No! <laughs> no, hold on, you might, you might still never see something. Maybe I'm just blind. So other than the, the lack of star charts and obviously a bit of luck, these objects are extremely difficult to see. So what about things beyond Neptune and, let's say, Uranus? How are you supposed to see them? With a telescope this big, it's very difficult. Um, And, in fact, I think what a lot of people don't realise is just how small these things are and how dim they are. So to spot these things, you need a very large telescope, you need a very high-resolution camera, and the tricky bit actually can often be um, you need a long, what we call an integration time. So... Being, doing astronomy is kind of like trying to catch raindrops in a bucket where the raindrops are the photons, the raindrops are the light. And uh, you, can, you can make your bucket bigger, which is using a bigger telescope, or you can leave the bucket outside for longer. And that's the integration time, that's the time that you look at something. So this means that while we can get really gorgeous pictures of things like other galaxies that we know stay very still in the sky... Uh, an object that's moving or an object that's faint, um, that we're not really sure what we're looking for, can be a lot harder... The stuff beyond Pluto, then, is known as the Kuiper Belt. What is it? And if it is so dark and doesn't reflect much light and it's really hard to see, how did we discover it in the first place? So the Kuiper Belt is, well, you you know the asteroid belt, right? 
Yeah, the thing, the, the, the group of icy blocks just beyond Mars, yeah? Exactly. So the, the Kuiper Belt is the edge of the solar system version of that. Uh, just like the asteroid belt is made up of all these, these chunks of rock that never really made it to form a planet, the Kuiper Belt is the stuff beyond Neptune that never really made it to form a planet. So as for the question of, I guess, how do we know that this stuff is out there, dwarf planets like Pluto, these planets we can see. Um, unfortunately, you can only see them with a bigger telescope than this one, obviously, which is why a lot of them weren't discovered until relatively recently. Smaller objects are trickier, but we do have some information there because even if they're very small and very faint, one of the really interesting things about the Kuiper Belt is that sometimes things fall inwards from it. Fall inwards? I'm sure you'll be aware that there are some very famous comets, for example, Halley's Comet. Comets like this that have, they're called short period comets, they're thought to come from the Kuiper Belt. How did it suddenly go from an object to becoming a comet? One of the really interesting things about all this stuff out there beyond Pluto is that because it was formed when the solar system was coalescing and was, was in its infancy, it never necessarily had the chance to settle down into stable orbits. So a lot of the stuff that happens out there can be quite chaotic. Perhaps you get um, a big object passing through that perturbs these things and sends them swinging in towards the centre of the solar system. Perhaps something happened early in the solar system's formation that uh, sent these things out on very long elliptical orbits. And perhaps this is why we see them coming past every so often. It was really amazing to see the whole roof open up above your head. That was Cambridge University's Scott Thomas. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Connie Orbeck, and Greer Jackson. Staying on the spacey theme, we went Mars mad in October with four whole episodes devoted to the rocky red planet. Now, there was just too much amazing audio to cover in a best of, but luckily, I put together a handy summary. Here at The Naked Scientist, we've been on a trip. Destination, Mars. We've learnt what it takes to be an astronaut from stomach-churning training. <laughs> Expect I look like a burner dog. Oh, I can feel my hands really pressurised. Oh, it's difficult to lift my hands. That feels like you've done the biggest roller coaster ride ever. <laughs> to the hundreds of silent workers who put our heroes in space. You've got the engineers who design these things, there are the people who built it, there are the medics, there are the doctors, there are the lawyers, there are the people like myself looking after the education programme. The list is truly endless. But even the bravest astronaut may still quake in their boots when they hear of the journey conditions. Oh, blimey, two weeks without a shower? Uh, Well, imagine turning off the gravity and turning on the shower. Water would go flying everywhere... So if you want to take a bath, it's going to be a sponge bath. Oh, and all the other hazards? Probably the main consideration is is the radiation environment. We're leaving the protection of the Earth's atmosphere and you are then subject to the full force of solar wind and cosmic radiation. We're well aware of the effect uh, of radiation on the human body. It does not do nice things and you've got to fly through that for nine months. Once there, there's a whole host of new problems, especially if we want to stay for a while. If we want to survive, we go somewhere that's warm and cosy and has resources. Now, if you want to go somewhere warm, that's rather incompatible with finding somewhere where there's accessible ice, uh, if you want water. And finally, if we've worked out all of that, we're going to have to consider the long-term impacts of settling on Mars. Whereas it may be the case that the initial settlers could come back to Earth if, if things go badly. For those born in Mars, it's extremely unlikely that their physiology could cope with a, a return to Earth. Their, their bone density wouldn't be right for it. So we, we have to get this right. I think we just about used every space scientist we could think of that month. Back here on Earth, though, this summer we did our whole show on computer programming in front of a live audience in Cambridge. Other than being more than a little stressful for just about everyone involved, it was also huge fun. I especially loved when Kat got to explore her musical interests with Sam Aaron, the man behind Sonic Pi, a programme that can be used to code music. 
I mean, we've just heard about how important it is to get people to code. In my opinion, it's not just about getting people to be professional programmers, but also use code to express themselves. In the same way we write and read, we write diaries, we write poems, we can also use code in the same way to express ourselves in really exciting new ways. And so Sonic Pi is software which allows you to write code, basic words... Press a special magic button and hear amazing sounds. As a musician, I'm really excited by this, and I know a lot of computer musicians, they're using programs like Ableton and things like that that cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds to make music, and often I I play with them. So how is this different? Why did you make this? I mean, I, I downloaded it earlier for free. Absolutely. So you heard Eben earlier talking about lowering the barrier to entry. I mean, part of the deal about the Raspberry Pi is extremely affordable. And so the software I've written is also extremely affordable. It's entirely free. Um, and so the idea is, if you don't have any money, it doesn't matter. You can use this software. And also, it runs on all computers. So it runs on a Raspberry Pi, but also runs on a Windows or a Mac. So if you already have a computer, use that. But if you don't, then get one of these Raspberry Pis because they're really wicked fun. Now, is this just a way of basically tricking kids and tricking even adults? into doing a bit of coding or is it actually genuinely a musical tool could you make musical compositions that would stand up on this? I mean is writing poetry tricking kids into grammar right <laughs> clearly not right so, so this well, is not tricking bit. people into the writing code code is an amazing expressive form uh, and it's just showing people that potential and yes Sonic Pi is a new musical instrument that you can use today to perform in nightclubs and venues to make music, and it's a lot of fun. Right, and well, enough talking about it. Let's see it. So we've got a computer screen set up. We've got your little um, Raspberry Pi, sort of naked circuit board sitting there. And on the screen, I can see just some lines and lines and lines of code. They look like words, sleep, bit crusher, saw, sustain. What is this? So I'm showing you here one of the examples. So when you start up Sonic Pi, you have a help system Health system contains a bunch of examples. This is one of the pre-canned examples, just to show you what you can do with the system. So, should we? Should we hear it? Yeah, yeah. Go on. Let's play something. Give it a go. Right. So we're getting some like dance music here. This is all generated in uh, real time on the Raspberry Pi using lots of fancy mathematics to make the sounds. The synthesizers are all real time generated. So this little Raspberry Pi is extremely capable machine. It's able to do this. So I use this same system to perform on stage in nightclubs. That is incredible. I mean, I kind of, you know, it's kind of pumping. We're all like, yeah, come on, hands in the air, people. <laughs> They're going wild. Reach for the lasers. Calm down, people, calm down. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that on the, uh, right. on the radio. So what have we got going on here? So it's making drums and synths and all these kind Absolutely. of things. Absolutely. So shall I get, show you how to get yeah, let's, started? Let's so have a go. Let's, do, let's make a tune. The Bang in the tune. Come on. <laughs> so the, the first word to learn in Sonic Pi is the word play, because we're playing a note, but also playing. We're having fun, right? So I write the word play, and then I choose a number to play. Let's choose, like, 80. We hear a little beep, right? That's it. That's okay. your first program. How easy is that to write? Yeah, that, that was even I, I think. <laughs> right, <laughs> As a so kind of notes and paper steps. musician could do that. So once you, once you write your first program, the next thing is how do you change these things? So now we can change this number 80 because numbers can go up and down. Notes can also go up and down. So if I choose a no- lower number, like 60, get a oh, lower note. Yeah, it's right? much lower. Or okay. 90, you get a high note. Right, so done. So now we can play all the notes we can imagine. Then we need a way to make a melody. Okay. So if I play note 60, then I need to have a way of saying, well, wait for a bit, so let's sleep for a second, and then play another note, play 65, say, and then let's sleep for half a second and play 72. So this way you're able to uh, play different notes and make a little melody, right? Oh, I like that. It's- At this point, with these two commands, play and sleep, we can play pretty much all of Western notation. So if you take any Bach or Mozart or Beethoven with two commands, you can reproduce those things. It's not slamming beats yet, but we've already done classical music. <laughs> OK. <laughs> can we make it a bit more funky? Can we, yeah, uh, so can we get it kind of going? The next thing we need breathing. to do is we need to, once we've got play and sleep, we need com- some programming structures to help us to, to manipulate this stuff. So I've invented something called the live loop. And a live loop is just a thing which can loop, right? So let's play a, a sample... Loop Amen, which is an Amen Is that break. the Amen break? Yeah. Very well known. Sleep for the one length of that sample. That's what drum and bass is made of, fans. But now we've got this loop going round. OK, but whilst it's playing, I can now change the, the rate, say, to be half. And now we've got it at half, and I can bring it back up to one again. And I'm just changing one number here. Let's go reverse, minus one. Let's add some, uh, some bass. And then let's add some slicer to slice the volume in and out. So I just choose where to start the slicer and where to end it. 
And so just by adding a simple piece of code on top of another simple piece of code... I think we've got a number one hit here already. I mean, it's kind of... It's, it's fairly boring and repetitive, but, but uh, there you go. Well, I mean, that's what dance music is. <laughs> exactly. You have to be able to dance to it, you know? So you say it's fairly boring and repetitive, but we've only got nine lines of code here. How long would it take someone like me to actually make a, a tune, a, a kind of a song with a beginning, a middle and end, some structure... It depends on how complicated your tune will be. I, I went to a school in Newcastle, Benton Park Primary School, where they have a Sonic Pie orchestra, and they've been teaching themselves, the kids have been teaching themselves, and the kids, the primary school kids, have been teaching their local teachers how to do this stuff. This is 10-year-olds, OK? So you just need some time and some creativity and some fun and some patience. In a few days, you can get the basics down, and then depending on how much time you want to put into it. In the same way, if you want to learn a violin, how much practice you put into it, you can get to do some wicked things pretty quickly. And is there transferable skills from learning to, uh, to write this kind of stuff? Absolutely. This, this system is written in the same language that Twitter was originally written in, <laughs> using exactly the same structures uh, as Twitter was originally written in. So you absolutely, and all the, the UK government work is all written in the same language. It's a language called Ruby. Uh, so, also boring and repetitive. Absolutely <laughs> transferable, yeah. Uh, but code is not boring. It, it can be repetitive. But the computer does a repetition, not you. So we're going to have a little bit of time now. I want you to show me what you can do. Come right, on, okay, let's because uh, let, you play in nightclubs, don't you? you? You've played this stuff out, and people do dance to it. Absolutely, yes. So let's choose one of the examples of the way to start. So this is an example called Tilburg. So this is going. So I've got my basic tune round. It's very hard to play without. I can't fully hear myself. Normally, the beats are bashing out. <laughs> right, so I can turn the randomization off. I do like my house music, and this sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. So I start and stop it. Sorry, I made a mistake. So you can make mistakes all the time. That's totally fine. Right, so turn off bits. Turn off the bass drum. And then get the rhythm going again. Kick. And then drop the kick in again. And off we go. So all I'm doing there is editing some very simple lines to make that happen. So it's called Sonic Pie, and uh, people can go home and have a go. Thank you very much. That's Sam Aaron, computer scientist from Cambridge University. Now, music clearly makes great radio, and for a naked scientist, it doesn't get much better than music composed from science. This ideal experience came to Chris earlier this year with a process called data sonification, which turned the measurements from the experiments that uncovered the Higgs boson into a piece of music. Domenico Vicinanza heads the Electronics and Sound Engineering Research Group at Anglia Ruskin University. He's used a process called data sonification to turn the measurements from the experiments that uncovered the Higgs into this music. It's beautiful. How do you do this? What's the secret? Thank you very much. Well... What we are listening to is the result of a process called data sonification. And data sonification is all about making measurements like like physics, uh, like physics measurements that the scientists did in 2012 into something audible. So if you like, it's like using notes and melodies to represent data instead of using conventional points and lines. Which data did you use? So in this case, we use energy measurements uh, that were taken by physicists in 2012. So what we are listening to is the, is the distribution of the energy going from really low to high energies when the, when the Higgs was actually discovered. I see. So when you see a collision happen, those recordings that were made in the detectors at CERN, they've given you that data and you've done something to it to turn it into a tune. Exactly. So, and what we what we did to the to, to the measurements was mapping them, was basically associating to each single measurement, in each single number, a music note using an algorithm, so a set of rules that are actually uh, linking the data to to the music notes and giving a melody. There's only a small number of notes, but the energy levels must have been a continuous variable. It must have been over a huge range. So how do you turn something with many, many, many possible energies into a discrete number of musical notes? 
So what we did was actually using a mapping process to it was compressing the range of of, of the of the energy variation to uh, a, a certain number of um, of octaves on uh, in in music in music terms. And we, we decided that beforehand, so we had an orchestra, so we had instruments able to, to play really low notes like double basses, to instruments able to, to, to play really high pitch notes like, like flutes and piccolos. And so we decided beforehand what was our range or energy range in, in sonic terms in, in some way, and we did the mapping. You've got a, a real kind of orchestrated piece here, though. It's not just individual discrete notes. So how did you then add the extra layers of orchestration? Did you apply one rule for one set of instrumentation, then another set of rules for another, and then get something that sounds good? So the, the way I actually did that, that, that was indeed a possibility. So what I preferred to do <clears throat> was taking the, taking the energy measurements and create one single long melody, really long one. And then I was listening to it, and I was extracting pieces of this long melody that was sounding particularly nice or was particularly suitable for, for a noise orchestration. And then I, as a composer, what I, what I also, what, what, I, what I like to do was actually using the right pieces for the right instruments. So, and I actually started working, trying to, trying to imagine how, the, how the, these little pieces could layer on top of each other. And uh, I, I worked on my orchestration to create, to tell a story. And the story I wanted to tell was how the, the discovery happened. So working from low energy, low frequencies, double basses and cellos at the beginning, and having it building up with, with, with woodwinds and with horns, creating, so sustaining the melody, and finally the, the big discovery. Did CERN like it? They, they did, actually, yes, they did very much. And, and they actually used the, uh, the piece for the, as a soundtrack for the, for the video of Atlas, which is one of the experiments and the, and, and the and source of, of data I actually used. Wonderful. Could you use the same technique to do other data? Presumably you could. Indeed. So data sonification is a really, really general um, uh, technique that maps measurements to, uh, to, to, to numbers or so Actually, measurements to uh, to music to music notes, so we can actually use it to represent what, what, whatever we we like. For example, I was recently involved in a, in, a, in a research actually using data sonification to uh, to help uh, doctors to uh, to discriminate between between healthy and uh, and potentially dangerous cells in uh, in, in cancer. So we're actually using sound to discriminate between healthy and unhealthy healthy situation. Where previously they would look down a microscope and try to discriminate visually, you would what, have a computer read a slide and translate what it's seeing, in inverted commas, into sounds, and then the doctors are using their ears to discriminate rather than exclusively their eyes. Exactly. And the reason why we are doing that is because we believe that, that ears can, can be much better than eyes in, uh, in discriminating anomalies and discovered patterns. So in some sense, the, so the earring sense is, is a neglected one. So we are, we are so much relying today in, uh, in looking at graphs and looking at visual representation of, of, of information that we, we, we forgot that we can actually uh, use other senses. And earring is, is one of the best ones. We have one of the, one of the probably most complex way of detecting patterns embedded in our, in our ears, and we are not using it. I suppose this is the audio equivalent of creating a graph if i've got a complex series of numbers and i want to represent them in the way that makes them easier to interpret and to show what the trend is i draw a graph you're doing the same thing with music for big data sets exactly and what we are what we are hoping to do is actually using the the natural capability of, of our ears in detect trends and patterns and anomalies so one of the examples I would really like is, is when we when we think about a graph and we think about lots of points in a graph. Sometimes it's really really difficult to identify one misplaced points in a, in a, in a graph. And if we we think about a melody which has a lot of notes and really complex, it's quite easy actually to spot a wrong misplaced note in a, in, a, in in a melody. And that's all because we are so good in detecting anomalies and patterns using our ears. Domenico Vicinanza from Anglia Ruskin University. There are no wrong notes in your composition. It's beautiful, and here's a little bit more to listen to. You can catch the rest on the Naked Scientist website. We'll put a link there to it.
on that note, I think we've come to the end of the show and I guess to the end of the year. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Connie, for putting this show together. And indeed, thank you to everyone else who's been involved in The Naked Scientists. We couldn't do it without you. We'll be back next year and next week with another special show looking at what makes you, you. I'll be trying to find out why my brother has a six pack and I don't. Is it because he got the good genes? If you'd like to get in touch with us before then, you can. Please tweet us. It's at Naked Scientists. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the STFC, the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. Until next time, goodbye.